everybody to today's program, uh, Secret Gardens Revealed. My name is Chris Alexander. I'm a librarian at the Saratoga Springs Public Library. We're delighted to be co-sponsoring this program with Seroptimus International of Saratoga County. If you have any questions for our panelists along the way, um, please type them in the chat and the moderators, moderator will read the questions out loud. If you are willing, when you select the chat, you can um, send the question to all panelists and attendees and everyone can see your question. Um, at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Mary Caroline Powers of the Seroptimist, who is the moderator for today's program. And she's going to introduce the gardeners on today's panel. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, to all of you listening, thank you for joining us. We're delighted to have you. Today, we're going to talk about the 2021 uh, Seroptimus Secret Gardens Tour. But just a moment um, to use up uh, some time to talk about, not use up time, to spend some time talking about uh, the Saratoga chapter of Seroptimus. It was formed in 1979. We are part of a larger international professional women's service organization that's marking its 100th anniversary this year. Seroptimus is a coined word and it means best for women. And that captures the essence of what the organization does. We create access to ways that society and individuals can improve the lives of women and girls around the globe. The funds we raise from events like the Secret Gardens Tour help Saratoga Seroptimus support mobile medical clinics in Central America in drilling for fresh water wells in parts of Africa. Closer to home, we give our time and our talent to the Hope and Power Project in partnership with Wellspring to help victims of domestic violence move toward a more positive life. We underwrite several scholarships for women and girls returning to the classroom to improve the prospects for themselves and for their families. And we sponsor the Dream It Be It program that offers girls in our surrounding communities the chance to see what they might want to become in the future and then meet women who offer examples of achievement and lessons from their journeys. This year, for the first time, Dream It Be It is partnering with the Saratoga County Women in Government Leadership Program and offering an opportunity to our high school age girls in Saratoga County to learn more about county government. These are just a few of the ways that the Saratoga Seroptimus use the dollars raised from fundraising activities like the Secret Gardens Tour. And the Garden Tour, in its 26th year this year, will be held Sunday, July 11th from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. There are 10 gardens on this year's tour located in Saratoga Springs, Boston Spa, and Schuylerville. Several of the garden owners had previously agreed to be on the 2020 tour, which then had to be canceled because of COVID-19. By the way, this year's tour will be conducted adhering to all New York State and any local guidelines regarding coronavirus precautions. So anyway, we are back this year and we're raring to go. And we suspect a lot of garden lovers are too. The gardeners are also anxious to show you their gardens and three of them are joining us today. Please welcome Christine Burghardt, Liz Cormos and Kathy Roberts, who are here to describe their gardens to you, show you some photographs, many of those taken by the talented local photographer, Brian Hoffman, and answer your questions about their gardens. By the way, um, the photographs, which are just beautiful, were taken last year before we had to cancel, but they're just, just as applicable this year because as Kathy Roberts um, explained to us yesterday when we, we did a short rehearsal, this has been a spectacular growing season. And I think our tour participants are gonna see the likes of flowers they haven't seen in many, many years because we had a mild winter. So without further ado, let's start with Christine, whose beautiful garden is in Boston Spa. Christine, welcome. All right. Well, thank you, Mary Caroline. Uh, I'm really, really excited for July 11th, uh, being able to show everybody my yard. Uh, I'm very proud of what I've done. I love what I have, and I can't wait to share it with everybody. Uh, before I moved to Boston Spa, um, I didn't have a lot of time and I didn't have a lot of money for gardening. Uh, but what I did have was seven acres uh, in Skaharie. Uh, so I had nature all around me. 
I was able to uh, mow paths and fields. I was able to move rocks. Uh, Skahari has a lot of rocks. Mm -hmm. I was able to move the rocks in front of hedgerows and uh, make beds, uh, perennial beds. Uh, so that's what I could do. Some of those perennials, uh, a few of them I did actually bring. Uh, when I moved here in uh, 2012, I moved in with Carl. And um, it, was, uh, it was tough back then uh, to look out the window, uh, to, to look out the window and, and kind of see what wasn't there. There was no nature. Um, there, was, uh, there was grass uh, that wouldn't grow. It was too sandy, too shady. Uh, there was a less than attractive above ground pool. Um, there were maybe five to six shrubs, two, two hostas, hardly any birds. Put up a bird feeder. Um, but there just wasn't, wasn't much there. Uh, so like I said, it was really tough. I knew I, I had to do something. I didn't know that I was going to, I wasn't, didn't know that I was going to do this, what I've done. Uh, but I, I knew I needed to do something. And um, so my original intent uh, was to keep it simple. A few shrubs, perennials, um, mulch for easy maintenance. Back then, um, Carl was the one that was doing the yard work or mowing. Uh, he didn't care to be doing that. Uh, certainly didn't want to make more work for him. Um, but, but actually, shortly after that, I took over the mowing. Um, took over the yard. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so little by little, uh, my gardens grew. I'd walk around. And um, I would just say, oh. I have an idea and I kind of like bump out another area. I bring more plants, more rocks, more mulch. And um, sometimes I was like a crazy person just backing up my little car um, down the driveway and unloading whatever I find, whatever I could bring in. In um, 2016, we put in the pond. Um, love the pond. There's a picture of uh, my fish that's, that's flashed back there, the big fish. That's a koi. But in 2016, we put in the pond, uh, there was a 24 foot sandy circle where the pool had been. And there's uh, just a natural gentle slope to the backyard. So it was, it was just perfect for the stream. And um, within a week, uh, there's my stream. Within a week, uh, frogs had moved in and I bought six fish. Uh, they did their thing. and. And now I have uh, probably over 40 fish. Uh, I have given a lot of fish away. So there's dragonflies and damselflies, uh, plenty of birds. Last year I was sitting there at the pond and a, flat, a flock of uh, cedar waxwings came down and, and they just took a bath at the top of the stream and then they moved off. In the winter, I watched a hawk. He stood on the edge of the pond for probably about 10 minutes, just. He took a drink, looked around, took a drink. It was, it was just, just amazing. And um, oh, and last week, last week, woohoo! I saw my first frog, or my first snake. I've seen frogs a lot, but my first snake. So it was like, oh, happy day! I was, I was thrilled. Wow. And um, so, anyhow, there, there's, a, there's nature out there, and I love it. But when I first started. Um, Many of the plants, though, um, many of the plants were kind of like good deals. Uh, whatever I could get, I always appreciated people giving me free plants. Uh, I would get uh, a lot of the little three-inch um, perennials. That's what I started with. A lot of those, uh, the coneflower, there's a picture of um, in there somewhere. And uh, a lot of those were just three three-inch pots, and that's where they came from. A lot of Craigslist offerings. Um, I did help a friend redo one of her established beds in, in it was her shade gardens. I came home with a lot of the shade plants you'll see in my shade garden. Um, so that was great. And, and of course, a lot of the plants were, were from impulse buying. You know, whatever was in, in the bloom at the garden center, which I think we all probably do that. Uh, we kind of feel like, oh, we have to have that plant. Uh, but last year, uh, let's see, I attended a, a native plant lecture um, and it introduced me to the, the, uh, the book, Bringing Nature Home, uh, this book here. And it really, really has changed the way I look at gardening. 
the way I look at plants, uh, I'm really kind of realized the importance of ecologically smart plant choices, uh, native indigenous plants, um, plants that are co-evolved with uh, wildlife will help support that wildlife. Um, so moving forward, that's, that's really what I, I'm focusing on. Uh, let's see, I, I love to watch, so I love to watch everything that, that flies, flutters, crawls. Uh, I love to go behind the, um, the garage to my service area and my compost bins. And, and I'll just turn over the, um, the compost and just watch what wiggles around. And I, I just love that. So um, I also love to, to walk around and, um, and see the different uh, mosaic pieces, uh, garden glass. I call it, uh, it's, it's what I've made in the winter. It's kind of like my winter hobby. Um, but there's, uh, there's quite a lot of uh, little surprises tucked here and there. Um, I love, like I said, I love to just walk around and find uh, surprises along the way. Um, now, Chris, can, love, I, can I interrupt you and, and ask you how, how you started creating your mosaics just to your I glass? Just, you know, I just always love the look of, you know, you go online and you see what people can create and wow, I just get blown away at, at what people create. I think mine are, are you know, they're, they're pretty simple compared to, you know, some of these these uh, murals and these amazing wow. pieces. Uh, You're probably the to your garden though. You know, you, you don't, you know, size, big size doesn't make something better. You're scaling yeah. pieces to your garden. <laughs> yeah, I just love the way it's, it's kind of like tucked in um, the peace sign that I made, uh, in the, that's back up in the corner at the shade garden. Uh, but in the morning, the sun comes through and especially after it rains, it kind of just glistens. Uh, so it's pretty cool. Uh, yeah. so I love that. Um, but there's, there's so much to look at uh, little things, uh, which like I said, I, I love any garden to, to be able to tour things and, and see more than just plants. Um, I, I think that that's what brings the garden to life to another dimension for me, at least. Um, and I hope you think so too, uh, when you come to visit. Um, so when you come to visit, you know, there's a, I hope you can take your time, sit and relax. There's plenty of places to sit. Uh, but there's other amazing gardens, uh, nine other amazing gardens out there that you'll, you'll definitely want to check out. So whether you stay here or whether you move on rain or shine, uh, it's going to be a great day and, uh, can't wait to see you. All right. Thank Christine, you. thank you so much. Um, she really has created a, a magical mystery tour around her house. It's, it's very special. Also very special and also in Boston Spa is the extraordinary garden that Liz Cormos has created. There's a little bit of something for everyone. Some exquisite flowers, some beautiful grasses, exotic vegetables, very unusual flowering shrubs, and Liz joins us now to tell us about her garden in Boston Spa. Thank you. Um, my name's Liz Cormos, and I live in the village of Boston Spa. Um, in 2012, we decided to downsize our suburban home and move to a village. After looking around the capital region, we found a <clears throat> half-acre lot right in the village of Boston Spa, walking distance to the center of town and the coffee shops and the restaurants. And so we built a brand new Energy Star 5 Plus age-friendly home. And I got to do a garden from scratch. It was previously just lawn and trees. So we hired a landscape architect to lay out, primarily to lay out the drainage because this lot was almost dead flat and had a layer of clay under it. And we were worried about the drainage. And I also gave her a list of all the perennial plants that I wanted to relocate from our previous home in Borisville uh, up to the new garden and asked her to please find, you know, do a design and find a spot for them. She also suggested a lot of native plants and bushes to add to the perennials. So the house took about a year to build. And every time we made the trip up, we dug out some of my perennials, brought them up, dug a hole in the back and put the perennial in there. Um, 
then I, what, one thing I did do because I was putting all these plants in one place is I, I did labels. I did plant labels and I continue to do that. And I find that very useful. So I know what I planted. So when the house was finished in August of uh, 2013, we had four truckloads of compost brought in. I mean, dump truck loads, huge. My husband and I did all the work. We laid out all the beds according to the plan, filled them with compost and started moving all those perennials and buying those native bushes. What happened is my measly looking perennials from Voorheesville took off such that in one year, a Seroptimist knocked on the door and asked if we'd like to be on the tour in 2015. And I was like flabbergasted. I mean, I said, this garden's a year old. And they said, no, it looks beautiful. So uh, fast forward to 2020 and the invite came again. Uh, by then the garden had matured and I had to start thinning out uh, plants like these, these uh, hostas in front of our porch. Um, unfortunately, as you heard, COVID canceled the 2020 garden tour. Uh, next slide. I continue to add plants wherever there's, there's an empty space. Uh, next slide. Yeah. This lily is a David, David Saxton lily bought flower unseen from the Heritage Garden Club. And you can see it's an absolutely gorgeous uh, day lily. Uh, next slide. I always wanted a pergola. That was one of my garden dreams. So I convinced my carpenter brother-in-law to build one for us. Um, and this is the result. And we grow grapes and hardy kiwi on it. Um, <clears throat> behind the pergola, next slide. Uh, you can see the grapes there. Behind that is uh, a vegetable and berry garden of 12 raised beds built by my husband. So very, very handy to have a husband who has a, has a, has a table saw. Um, another suggestion by the landscape architect was this bog garden. So when we built the house, the water drains off the roof into underground pipes, PVC pipes that empty into this bog area, which was just dug out by the excavator and surround, you know, with rocks uh, that were dug from the uh, property around it. So when we get a heavy rain, like we did this last weekend, it fills up about halfway and then slowly drains off the next day. And as you can see, this is kind of my area, you know, to put glass and, and fun stuff. Um, all sorts of plants that like wet feet grow here. Things like cardinal flower, ferns, native iris, marsh marigold, obedient plant. And this was kind of a new, new thing for me because I had always just, you know, done traditional perennials in, in beds. Um, next slide. We get the next slide, yeah. Um, hostas, ferns, uh, pulmonary uh, uh, grow in front of the porch. And, you, and behind, you know, in the front of the house is a large planting bed uh, that has uh, bee balm, daylilies, echinacea, joe pie weed, which is the, the tall stuff in the back there, um, and culver's root growing. Uh, this also has two rain gardens. So the drainage from the front of the house uh, goes off underground to, to this area as well. Um, the, by the way, the pollinators love this garden. It's just full of, of a multitude of, of little insects and honeybees and everything. They just love this garden. Uh, next slide. I also add, you know, pots of annuals around the garden so that there's always something um, blooming. Next slide. This is one of the unusual bushes I planted. It's called Calicanthus aphrodite or sweet shrub. It has uh, fragrant uh, magnolia-like flowers that last most of the, the summer. Next slide. You can see the whole, whole tree bush here. Here, it's in front of a white, white fence. It, it's really an interesting, interesting plant. Uh, next slide. 
As you can see here, I added grasses, which were also new plants to me. I had never really planted grasses before, and they make wonderful screens. Uh, when we sit on the patio, you know, it sort of screens us from, from the neighboring property. And then behind the parking area, you know, forms a screen. Um, next slide. This is another uh, plant, a tree suggested by, by that landscape architect, and it's called Carolina Silverbell. And although it's a Carolina plant, it grows well quite here and it has these very pretty little bell-like flowers. Uh, next. Lastly, on the north side of our property in the back corner, we have a sort of mini orchard. Uh, these are nanking cherries, which bloom, uh, have wonderful white flowers in the spring, and they produce an abundance of these tiny little cherries um, if you look at the next slide, and I use these to make cherry jam. They're not really eating cherries because the pit's about the same size as, as you know, you get as much pit as you do that. But uh, if you cook them down, they make a wonderful cherry jam. Uh, next slide. The most unusual of our uh, orchard trees is for pawpaw trees. These trees, which are smaller sized trees, uh, started to produce fruit about four years ago, no, two years ago, and gave us lots of pawpaws last year. They are lumpy looking, tropical looking fruit that actually tastes like a cross between a mango and a banana. And it's something you would never think if you were served it, you would think it came from the tropics, but it grows here. Last slide. One more slide, I think, in there. Oh, yeah, this, this was from 2015. I'm really excited to be on the tour this year and hope you've come to see my garden and Christine's and Kathy's and the other seven gardens. Um, you'll, you'll be delighted at the variety and, and the differences that you, you find in each garden, and you're bound to come, come home with some great ideas. Thank you. Indeed, you are. Liz, thank you so much. That really uh, is an extraordinary garden. It's a very beautiful garden that she's created, and it's a very productive garden. Um, I don't think any of your fruits will be producing by the time the garden tour occurs on the 11th of July, but um, maybe you can go back and visit and get some cherry jam. So thanks <laughs> again so much, Liz. And now joining us is Kathy Roberts, all the way from Schuylerville and from Fiddle Eye Fee Farm, here to tell us about her wonderful, wonderful acreage. Kathy, hello. Oh, hello. Thank, thank you, Mary Caroline. Could could you tell, well, Chris Alexander, you're on, the, the slides aren't coming through for me. So just keep sliding them through and let people figure out what they are, because I can't see them on my screen. So we can live with that, though. Um, so, um, okay, um, we've lived here in this spot for 50 years now, which is kind of extraordinary in this day of age, in age. So we came here in 1972 and um, we built um, a funny little house, which has gone through many more transformations. It's, um, we actually own 140 acres of woods and fields and we rent the fields to our dairy farming neighbors because we're in major dairy farming country. We also, the Winnie's Blueberry Farm is, is practically across the street from us also. So it's a major agricultural area in the county. Um, our land has been, the conservation, we've gotten a conservation easement through Saratoga, preserving land and nature. And we're very grateful for all the work that they did so that we could preserve this beautiful piece of land from, um, from development. Um, so our, our house and my primary gardens, which are around the house, are, um, they're off the road. They're, they're screened by, by fields and woodlands and wetlands. So we're really very private. No one really knows what is up here. So you will, you will have a treat being, being really seeing a secret garden because it's, it's very, um, very unexposed. Um, 
Oh, let's see. It's a very naturalistic garden. The only land disturbance we did here was um, digging the foundation for our house and the foundation for our my husband's barn and workshop. You know, we haven't contoured the land. We've left the glacial features as they were. And um, I grew up in the Connecticut River Valley in exactly the same soil as I have here. And I'm very grateful for that. I have no stones and rocks and gravel in my soil. I do not have clay that sticks to my feet. I am, I, I'm, I just landed in the same wonderful soil, the glacial kind of silt that I grew up in. And while silt last, lacks um, minerals and the kind of, and water retention that, um, that clay soils have, it really is wonderful to work in. I can, oh, there I can see a slide of, of, our, of our barn workshop now. Um, I can, um, yeah, it's wonderful to work in. Um, we built the, um, the Munters helped us build this barn workshop for my husband about 20 years ago, and he has his tool shop in, in here. Um, and of course, any place that I can plant a plant, I, I do that. So you'll see, um, oh, there's um, a go, a go, what is it called? A goji, it's a funny orange berry that looks very tropical. There's a wisteria and a goji uh, vine uh, growing up on this uh, kind of trellis next to the door. Um, so let's see, where am I? Okay, you could go on to the next, next slide, please. Um, so, there are just so many things that you will enjoy here that you may not have seen before. Uh, well, this is a house. So <laughs> our house has a very woodland feeling. It feels like the house and the gardens grew together and they really kind of did. When our, when our sons grew up and, and went away, they no longer needed space for tossing balls around. So the lawn shrunk and the gardens grew. And, um, I do a lot of mail ordering from exotic, well, exotic nurseries, places that you couldn't, you couldn't normally, um, unusual plants that you can't buy off the shelf around here. So I've, over the years, I've ordered a lot of things from, from uh, specialist nurseries. Um, there's a, a weeping purple beach that was an end of season sale. Uh, you can find exotic things here also. Um, uh, so let's see. So, oh, well, I'll go back to, um, oh, you can see a hosta now. Um, I have a prairie reconstruction in our, in our field next to our vegetable garden in our orchard. And there aren't any pictures of that, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but you can come here and see them when you come. And I started this prairie reconstruction 20 years ago because whenever my husband and I drove across the country to visit our Western son who very, at various times lived in Colorado, Montana, or now he's in Idaho. We would take our time driving across the Great Plains and look for prairie reserves and, um, and explore them. So I just was kind of a prairie nut. So um, we, I, I round up the field for a couple of seasons um, I know Roundup is a dirty word to say, but I'm going to use it anyway. And um, then I bought a mixture, a, a Zarek mixture, a dryland mixture, and a wetland mixture, a Mesic mixture for this, oh, about two acre field. And I planted it in the spring, you know, just scattered the seeds, the, mi the mixtures for the different uh, soil types. And then it didn't rain for six weeks. <laughs> And I thought, oh my God, those expensive seeds are all wasted. But magically, they're tough native prairie seeds and they came up. So I have a wonderful prairie for you to, um, to look at. It has evolved and the things that have wanted to live have lived and the things that the voles wanted to eat and that got crowded out by other things died but it is a viable and, and just a magical place. The grasses grow taller than my head. And, um, you know, it's full of sparrows and many insects. So, um, okay. So now I guess, yeah, I still be, I'm, I'm looking at the slide at, um, at, our, at my house garden. 
which is pretty enormous because as I said, the grass, the, 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 um, it doesn't take me very long to mow the lawn anymore, but it takes a lot more time to, to uh, take care of the gardens. Uh, but my strategy is always to work when you have a bed to exclude the grasses and the weeds, the perennial grasses, you know, like quack grass. Excluding them from moving into your garden is the best way to weed and not raking your leaves away in the spring is another way not to have to weed your garden. Um, letting the leaves, the fall leaves fall away where they may and just letting them stay there and decompose I found is a wonderful way to minimize your, your weeding. Um, so uh, since we've been here for 50 years, there is right now uh, just outside my door here, a tall, very tall Liriodendron tulipiferum, which is, we call a tulip tree. And it has these wonderful yellow and orange uh, tulip shaped um, flowers that the bumblebees love. And we planted it 45 years ago. And it is, um, I don't know how tall it is, 100 feet tall, 100, it's enormous. Um, uh, I see a slide for daylilies. Now there should be lots of daylilies in bloom when you come to visit because it will be July. Um, I'm very fond of their explosions of bloom and I've really sort of specialized in, in seeking out varieties that are tall, like five feet tall. Um, and I've even been playing with pollinating them. I say, oh, well, I'll cross this with that and I'll bring the pollen to, to different different plants. And then I've, I've got some seed beds um, where I, I, I uh, play with them and look at them, them and, you know, decide what I like and what I don't. Oh, this is my gate to nowhere. Um, <laughs> because, <laughs> because I could garden, I could garden 24 hours a day and never run out of land. <laughs> that's, one of, that's one of the problems of having abundance of acreage. So so it, at, the, at the back of our house, I, I bought, um, I bought this, this antique gated at Greenwich Hard, uh, Hardware Antiques and uh, my husband built the posts for them. And it's sort of a stopping place. It's where no more, you know, no more planted gardens beyond that, which of course still has not stopped me from planting things beyond that, but there are things that I don't have to overly take care of. Um, and the slide that's up now, my garden is very shady, very net. It's as the years, I mean, 50 years we've been here and these trees have grown and we're very grateful for that in a time of global warming. Um, uh, you know, pure sun has its, its charm, but in, in the depths of summer, we're very grateful for the shade. And this is a hard hydrangea arborescence uh, in, 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 invincible spirit too. It's a, uh, it's kind of a pinkish and you can cut it back halfway and it will rebloom on new wood. Just a wonderful kind of woodlandy looking plant. So there are a lot of woodlandy things in my garden. Um, um, oh, um, and I have Lysimachia, Lysimachia and um, oh, the berries, the doll, the doll eye berries. Um, I can't remember its name, but again, sh uh, plants that love the shade, um, they, you know, they spread themselves. I'm not always happy with where they go, but, you know, I try to manage them as best I can. And let's see what else. Oh, I do have a funny little story, a very tiny story. But years ago, I was a literary, literacy volunteer. And I had a 20 year old young man from Mississippi who was my student. And the first time he came up to my house for a lesson, he looked around and he said, where's the dirt? <laughs> because um, the, the finest way, the best way to keep weeds down is, is not, you know, mulch, mulch is you have a complete coverage of leaves and plants in your garden, there will be no room for weeds. Um, so it, it just was very funny to get Jimmy's perspective of a Mississippi garden, but I think he came from, you know, the place, a place, he came from the Delta in a place where there were swept gardens, where your, your front yard actually was packed down dirt. So that was his, his perspective. And now I think so, I probably- Yeah, 
I've talked myself out. No. <laughs> well, on that note, we have some questions piling up from our guests. Oh, okay. But um, I also wanted to give each of the panelists an opportunity to ask each other's questions. And um, while you're thinking about that, why don't we get to some of the questions that people have asked us? Um, the first set of questions came from Barbara. This may be oh. our own Barbara Lombardo, who was called away at the last minute and uh, very much regrets that she can't be with us today, but sends her best wishes. Um, she, the, this Barbara is asking, how do you protect the plants from critters and pests? Um, Christine, you've got, I think, a, an attitude toward critters and pests that's very welcoming. I do. Um, I actually used to, I don't, don't so much anymore. Um, I mean, I have feeders up, um, but I used to put out plenty of peanuts you know, for the chippy squirrels, whatnot. And um, I don't so much because it's not really, a, you know, a great diet for them. Um, but I love them. It's what what brings my my place to life. That's the nature I love. Um, you know, the chipmunks, especially right now, there's there's quite a lot out there. Um, you know, basically when I see that, it's like, oh, you know, I get excited. It's like, oh, chippy, I love you. <laughs> and, um, and, and they run away from me and I say, oh, where are you going? Come back. <laughs> You know, I, I think I have this little snow weight fantasy that they're going to hang out with me. Yeah. Um, but there, there really, really wasn't too much of a problem until last year. Um, I put up a um, animal sanctuary sign. My husband got me this, uh, he found this antique sign. And so I officially made it an animal sanctuary. And that seems to be when the, um, the bowls came in. So they did take out some of my hostas and I guess they, they just felt safe. Um, but you know what, that, that's, I, I, I don't have a problem with that. I can't have a problem with them. That's, that's not what I'm about. So, uh, the bunnies, I have a big bunny, little bunny right now. Um, they're nibbling in the grass and, and I love it. So keep them coming. What are you going to do? Okay. Um, I don't think we're going to find too many people chasing things out of their garden in this <laughs> panel. Uh, Liz, you had mentioned that you label everything. And one of our questions was, how do you make plant labels that are weatherproof and will survive the winter? Oh, my, my labels will last years, except so, sometimes they come off and I can't find them in the mulch and leaves, etc. <laughs> But um, it's I, the company, it's those metal labels. I think they're aluminum or something that wrap around a, a, a stiff wire frame. And what you do is go to, you know, a place like Staples, office supply place, and buy a P-Touch label maker and get the industrial weatherproof package of, you know, the, that goes into it. And you just type out the name because my handwriting's awful. So I was not going to handwrite my labels. Um, and I just type in, you know, when I buy a plant, I just type up a label, stick it on the metal, and they last for years. And, and you know, when people come, they can see the labels. I, I also want to mention, I, our, our relationship with wildlife is a little bit more love and hate. Um, because we have an extensive vegetable garden and we like to eat the lettuce and the kale and the, and the, the produce of it. So my husband is an expert at chicken wire and mm -hmm. fencing. <laughs> and that's how we, we protect. He just redid our strawberry protection from, we have one raised bed that's strawberries and we don't have such a kindly opinion of chipmunks because they went through and basically took a bite out of every strawberry. So now we have uh, something that hopefully will keep them out. They're, they're welcome to, to uh, you know, nibble on some things, but other things. I also use that uh, deer rabbit spray because I found that, you know, I put out annuals in pots and stuff and the rabbits would come and, you know, eat everything petunias, annuals and stuff, and that, you know, nasty tasting spray uh, works pretty well. Also lilies, you know, to keep animals from eating it. So that that's one way to, uh, you know, fencing. Um, although I hear electric fencing is the ultimate at Pitney Meadows. That's what they use. 
I'm thinking about adding that. Uh, and then the spray really to keep your, you know, precious perennials uh, not tasting too well so that they, they leave them alone. Great. Thank you, Liz. And you answered a couple of questions that we got along those lines. <clears throat> Here's another question, and I think Kathy might be the person to answer this. Um, can you give us a few ideas of the retailers you buy unusual plants from? Because, Kathy, you did mention that you oh, sort yeah. of search far and wide. Oh, yes. You know, the Googling is just the most amazing thing in the world. You can Google a specific plant that you want, or if you're into irises, you can just Google iris plants and, you know, a whole ton of shopping opportunities of, 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 of companies that mail order the plants will come up. Um, it really is, it's kind of actually fun kind of searching through um, you know, links and finding companies. You, you can just do it on the internet and just have fun doing it. And then you can, um, there are uh, sites that review, I think there's a garden, garden watchers. Um, at any rate, there are, there are um, sites that, that, so that you can get an idea of, of you know, whether you're gonna get a good plant from that nursery. But yeah. I've, just, I've just had great success with with mail order nurseries, you know, from, uh, you know, from a, from Oregon to, um, you know, more local ones in Connecticut and um, New Jersey. Um, it's it's just a great way to get unusual things that you could not find, you know, off the shelf in a, in a local a local retailer. So one of those review yeah. sites is Dave's Garden. And they, oh, right. Yes, yes, exactly. Yes, that's, that's one. That's site for yeah. description on, on plants. And also he has a review section. So people will say, you know, don't order from this nursery. The, the plants were awful. Mm -hmm. um, or the, the plants. Actually, the pawpaw trees, which were developed uh, at Cornell, the variety, to grow here, I had to order from Oregon. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Okay. I could not find a local yeah. retailer yeah. who sold so, the, the so Liz, just again to be sure we've got that clear. The site is Dave's Garden. Gardens. Yeah, Dave's okay. Garden. Yeah. I think if you just Google it, you'll probably come across it. Wonderful. We have two questions for Christine. The first is what is the name of the book you showed? And the second has to do with garden glass. Um, the questioner is wondering if you have time, do you bring the glass inside during the winter? Chris? Uh, well, everything that I made for outside can, can stay outside. The totem pole, that was actually my first big piece. Um, that's been in, in for a few years. That's um, in a pot, cement, uh, a pot of cement in the ground. And uh, the peace sign stayed out. Uh, that looked pretty cool with the uh, snow on it and um, the mushrooms I brought in, but they, they all are made um, to stay outside. So uh, that's fine. And, oh, and this is the book, uh, Bringing Nature Home by Doug Talmy. Um, he's an entomologist, which he's done wonderful um, work with um, just, uh, just ecological, just smart choices. I don't know, I'm starting to read about him and, and I really like what I'm reading. It just makes a lot of sense. Like I said, moving forward, I just I just want um, more wildlife and more everything. Yeah. Just let everything function and do it. Yeah. yeah. The glass yeah. That, that I had in, in my bog garden, mm -hmm. which are like blown glass pieces, some of them, and and you know where you go to Noah's attic or one of these and buy plates and glue them together to make you know decorative um, objects. Those I bring in. You know, I put them, I wrap them in newspaper, put them in the in the shed or someplace um, because they they they're a little bit more delicate than mosaics. Okay, well, thank you both. Good advice for Erico, wondering about the garden glass. Now I think it's it's uh, time to give each of our panelists a chance to ask each other questions. Some of you have seen each other's gardens, some of you have not. Um, Chris, I know that you've seen Kathy's garden, right? 
I've I've been to both uh, both their houses. Um, amazing, um, Kathy. You know you have such a wildlife wilderness thing going on, tucked in the woods. Uh, but you you have like you said the I remember the driveway with the fields and um, so much full grown. Uh, I I love how everything is established and um, the trees that you have have been there, so you can see. Wow, that's that's what the tree looks like. Um, so I just love that. And and Liz, uh, I love how you have the. I've been to your house also. Um, just the the beds, the, the big uh, sweeping beds and mass plants. Uh, so you have the the whole mass of hostas and bee balms and, and I love mass mass plantings and insects love them when um, you know there's more to see, more to land on. So that's that's better for the pollinators to have all the, um, just have masses of the same plant instead of, you know, like a hodgepodge of a plant, a plant, a plant, plant. So uh, they're both amazing uh, gardens. So um, I'm, I'm actually glad that I've seen them because on July 11th, I probably won't stop at your house. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll be here or at the other, I haven't been to, um, I went to the other garden, so I will check them out. So anyhow. <laughs> Yeah, that's one of the, the sort of negatives about being on the tour is because I like to stay, and, you know, answer questions is I can't go to Kathy's. And so uh, I, I remember a few years ago, you actually did do a sort of preview for the for the folks on the garden tour where all the participants the day before could go and and, and visit each other's gardens. So, so maybe might consider doing that or we I might. I'd love to see Kathy's particular. Oh, yeah. um, you're, you're welcome anytime. <laughs> okay. I, I'd like to see what you, you know, your shade garden plants, because um, we bought the lot, wooded lot next to us. And, yeah. um, so I am, you know, moving my divisions that are shade plants, you know, over there. And still have a lot of work to get rid of the, the honeysuckle and, and all the invasive stuff. Yes. But, um, you know, interested in more of a naturalistic uh, shade planting under those trees. Okay. That doesn't require too much maintenance because I got enough maintenance on my own. Yes, yes. I have, I drove by the, the three houses that are on the one street uh, last week or so. And their front yards look incredible. So I, I can't wait to see those three. Aren't uh, they pretty? Three That's three. Ludlow Street. In yeah, Ludlow. Yeah. Experience. That's amazing. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Okay. And that's three for one. You get to park and, and walk to each of the three. Yeah, Kathy, do you have any questions for the other panelists? Um, I was going to um, ask Chris, um, where did you go for the seminar on, um, on native plants that you were talking about? I, was, what, I think it was just um, it was just through the the multi library, it, um, and then talk and you know I I can't hear you right now. Oh, um, it was just a library talk, you oh, know, okay. like an hour library talk. But like I said, I, I found the book, and you know, there's so much on YouTube now. He's a he's a wonderful author. Yeah. And, uh, but I, I was going to, to say there, there's a wonderful reset resource in the, the Connecticut Valley, um, just north of Northampton in Waitley, Massachusetts. Um, the, the native plant, well, it used to be the New England Wildflower Society, which has now changed its name to the Native Plant mm -hmm. Trust, has um, a farm called Nasami Farm where they raise many native plants and um, you can go on, you know, because of COVID, they've had, a, you've had to make appointments to visit rather than just drop in and shop. But um, it's, an, it's another resource for native plants, both sun loving ones and shade loving ones. Oh, nice. And it's not that far away. It's really a, a nice, a nice trip. And they also have, uh, they sponsor many webinars and, and, and courses, you know, on many subjects. So it's just, um, an idea for, for everyone to, to think about um, expanding their knowledge about what's possible to do in their yards. Right. Well, after July 12th, I'll be ready for a road oh, trip. I know, I know. <laughs> no time to go anywhere right now. 
but yeah. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think of anything else to um, to ask. Does anyone else have any questions of, of, of you know, about our gardens? Oh, I know. Um, Liz, your, your pergola, um, did you design it yourself or did you, how did you come, how did you decide on, on its space and its size and, and all of that kind of thing? Well, you know, when we designed the house, uh, I don't think we had that in mind, but then, you know, one of the first things that was built actually before the house was, was our, the garden shed. And, okay. and, you know, because then they were able to store stuff in there. Um, and then, then it turned out that we had had a hot tub at our previous house that I planned on selling with the house. And the people that bought it didn't want it. And it was a really good hot tub. Oh. So we had a pad, you know, yeah. put in when we were having the patio, you know, area, the cement put in there. We had, you know, where are we going to put this hot tub? So we put it behind the house. And it was directly, you know, linear to the shed. Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, we'll just put it from the hot tub over to the shed. Yeah. And, and then, you know, we laid out the vegetable garden behind it. Mm -hmm. And that works real well because the, the raised beds right next to the pergola are, are somewhat shaded. And they're really good for growing kale and lettuces and greens versus the further beds, which, you know, grow more than sun loving um, vegetables. So, you know, it kind of worked out, but yeah, I, I looked at lots of different, you know, uh, Pinterest pictures and everything and, you know, came up with the, with the design and, and uh, had somebody, you know, do the footings, the, the cement tubes. Yeah. And then, you know, my, brother-in-law said yeah i could build that oh it, my goodness it, well, that's, that's amazing because i mean it's 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 a there are many design problems and you've got to make it strong enough and resistant to weather and um you've yeah. got to have it tall enough so no one hits their head against mm -hmm. uh, things so yeah well, well good for you that is so integral to the use of your your backyard also it's not just something that you threw out there it's something that you considered yeah well good oh, we have well, a question actually liz about um how to find a good landscape architect well the one we found her name is baba Rostano, and she's actually from the hudson valley and we found her when we were in sort of the design phase of the house at a at a uh seminar up at Skidmore, you know, it was about using native plants in landscaping. And she does, you know, commercial landscaping, I think, primarily. And uh, we just talked to her at the end of the, the session and said, well, you know, are you interested in, in, in working? Um, you know, we're building a new house and, and we, you know, and then we also attended a seminar um, by uh, a retired professor at Cornell, uh, uh, Lou, what was his, what's his last, Riker, I think Riker is his name. He lives down in New Paltz and has a, he calls it a farm den. Oh. And he gives seminars on pruning and on growing uh, fruits, nuts, vegetables, uh, mostly fruit and nuts uh, oh. in this climate that you don't need to spray you know, what grows here. And uh, that's how we got the idea of the Nanking cherries and the pawpaws and all of that. So, um, you know, local regional yeah. folks who, uh, you can buy his books, by the way. He, he, he has He's a very famous, really, in, in the plant world, in the compost world. A Lee, Lee Reich, I think it's. Yeah, Lee, Lee Reich, yeah. R-E-I-C-H, -R I think. And yeah, yeah. he's. he's yeah, really? and the composting, my husband has gotten very much into composting. Oh, wonderful. The compost beds. We got the design from, uh, we went to a wedding years ago at the uh, Bronx Botanical Garden, and they had a demonstration of, of, of compost bins built out of pallets. And we spent more time in the garden looking at that and taking pictures <laughs> at the reception. 
And, I forgot who got married, probably. Yeah, and now he is, uh, he's formed the Boston Spa Compost Initiative, which takes uh, food waste, vegetables and stuff from a number of restaurants and from the EOC, the food bank, because they get donations from the supermarkets and then what they can't use. Uh, and he has uh, home composters picking up buckets and leaving empty buckets for, for them and for some of our local restaurants to use. And I think they've kept over five tons of food waste out of, out of uh, landfills and, oh, and made compost. That's, that's remarkable. I'm afraid that we, we're going to have to wrap this up. We've used up a whole hour, but, um, and I want to remind people about where they can get tickets uh, if any of you are interested in getting more information about Seroptimist International of Saratoga County, just go to our website. It's seroptimistsaratoga.org. And on the website, there's a section called uh, Latest News. And in that section, there is information about ordering tickets online. The cost of the tickets are $25 pre-tour, $30 the day of tour. You can also buy tickets at the Visitor Center in Saratoga Springs on the day of tour. Um, the Visitor Center is directly across from um, Congress Park, <clears throat> excuse me. And there are also some other areas where you can buy tickets before the tour. And some of them include the Northshire Bookstore, Cudney's Dry Cleaners and Fatigan's Nursery in Latham. Um, before we leave, I, I just want to quote one of the participants in the chat who said, these women are amazing. And yes, they are. <laughs> thank you so much. So finally, we thank each of us or each of you who joined us today, special thanks to our three gardeners and to all the gardeners who are participating on the tour this year. And our uh, real deep gratitude to Chris Alexander, reference librarian at Saratoga Springs Public Library, who coordinated today's program with Barbara Lombardo and who provided exceptional technical expertise for all of us. All of us can attest to that too. So thank you again very, very much for participating. And we hope to see you all on tour day, July 11th, between 11 and 5. Thanks again so much. This was